ECGR 5101, 5101. This is Embedded App of the Day Redux. Uh, uh, this is the infamous um, uh, projectile uh, launcher uh, that was used at a recent Halloween party. And uh, this young man, uh, Sam Shu, will, will tell you about it. Okay, so this thing uh, has a little infrared scanner in the front and it scans the environment and then shoots it in and changes it season. So anybody that walks in front of it. All right, one switch turned it on. The other switch is now going to start the uh, the search. It's not cool. All right. Hey, Jim. Ah, <laughs> I hate when that happens. So uh, should we turn it off? Oh, right. Alright, so just think, if you don't move it, it'll stop. Alright, this is what you guys want to get used to. Alright, so, uh, um, so this is what you uh, get to do in your spare time. Did anybody actually look up the uh, the paintball firing device? Should I show a picture of that? Yes. Yeah, All right, just just for grins, because because what better thing to do in class than to waste time looking at YouTube videos? <laughs> this sounds good to me. Is this the paintball one? Uh, this is the paintball sentinel, I believe it is. <laughs> I still like where we go. All right, if I remember correctly, paintball. Uh, what, what is this? <laughs> Sentinel? It's Century. Century? Or Courage. This is the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> now this this may not be the one I'm thinking of. Okay, there we go. So, <laughs> again, paintball sentry. Keep in mind that uh, I know I hit my laptop. <laughs> yeah, well, you put paint on that, what do you know? Um, I guess there's a whole bunch of them with this. Yeah, video eight's pretty good. All right, so let's look at this uh, this person's uh, uh, videos and video eight. Yeah, I think that's the one I'm thinking of. By the way, is this supposed to be playing audio? Mm -hmm. You might want to add volume on the actual video. There it is. There it is. So the interesting thing about this is he did it with a PC and a laptop. Do you think this is something that can be done with an embedded system board? Yes. All right. So if you if you look at this, you have to look at what is the sensor? Can the sensor handle the input output requirements? Well, what's the output requirement? Pretty easy on this one over here, right? This was how much? Just uh, a couple of wires to control 
the turning. That's a servo, right? Right. So it's only controlling the servo and uh, and the firing. And that's done on this board with an Arduino. So this is just showing that it could it could track it. Now chances are the video camera that he has on this is detecting a lot more resolution than this simple uh, <laughs> than this simple uh, uh, um, ultrasound. So it's almost assured that he's doing something video, although I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Interesting enough, I believe this also has uh, laser on it. Does it, or is it just? Uh, it looks like it has laser, right? I think it has a little laser pointer on it. I think what he's doing is the image difference and whatever the difference is, it fires up. <laughs> Interesting that it. Uh, I believe he's got a camera that's sitting on top of the. The turret that is uh, <laughs> not bad, right? I think there's a comment in here somewhere. Um, <laughs> like you know, I, I I'm getting really tired of getting hit all the time. <laughs> I wonder who got paid to do this, right? So the uh, the most computationally intensive thing, notice it's also just a little bit head out there, it's, it's not able to detect every single motion. Because you probably need more, probably need more uh, res resolution and processing power, processing power to be able to detect minuscule types of motion. What is... Go ahead. Some of the, some of the ones later are, are rather oh, interesting. <laughs> a, a bike ride and I think driving up in a Jeep and uh, jumping on a trampoline. <laughs> Here we go. That's what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I want a vehicle like that. He's pulling up farther and farther away. It's going to another position after a while. Why do you, why do you think that is? It's guarding the target, basically. It's what? Guarding the target. That's the same thing. Yeah. See? It's supposed to be guarding the beer. Yeah. So, so that, that's, that's the main objective is to guard it. So that's okay. what it goes back to. However, you know, there are, if you think about an embedded system to that respect, you have to think about maybe some aspect of intelligence, right? Is it better to keep in mind that, oh, the last target I shot at was right there, so I'm going to keep pointing there because chances are my target is still there versus something else. Well, the other aspect of that, too, is if you're protecting something, you know, a second so here, yeah, a second person may come in, and get distracted between the two. So now you're you're thinking at a higher level. And so, uh, actually, can you pull the whole table back? Well, I, I'm going to do something on the screen for this. And that is, uh, if you think about, uh, embedded systems. That's 
Hey, what better way to uh, have fun than to think about this? All right, let's lecture eight, 18 still. You see GR 4101, 5101. So if you think about some of the things that we're doing, don't forget there's the hardware, right? And the hardware that you're controlling is either a, uh, uh, a sensor or an actuator. Which is getting directly ported via several lines to your microcontroller board. On top of that, you can do one of two things. You can add an operating system, and we're not even addressing very many aspects of operating system in this class. We'll cover it towards the end, but it's something that's more covered in an advanced embedded. And another aspect of an operating system is what we call roll your own. In other words, you're just writing a rudimentary system like uh, a, a simple while loop that will do everything you want it to do. That's in itself an operating system. Check this, check this, check this. But you worry about the entire loop, uh, making sure that everything's addressed, as opposed to an operating system where you have many, many, many things that could go on at the same time. Again, keep in mind, at the same time, there's only one processor. Only one thing can go on exactly at one time but you could have several things that it could switch between. And then on top of that is your app. And you've been writing all these apps, but there's different levels of these applications that you could write. You've been doing a lot of this low level application, software that actually controls the hardware. So what's that often called in the world of uh, computing? Drivers. Drivers. But then you have apps that are uh, high level. And one example of that was from this video that we just watched. Things like, all right, I know how to target something that moves because the actual moving something to that place or looking for something that moves and then focusing on that as a low level device driver. Now at a higher level it's kind of like, all right, I see the entire world, I see motion here, motion here, which one do I shoot at? You have to, you know, that's where they're talking about the distraction. So maybe the one that moves more, faster, or is closer to your your uh, base or whatever you're trying to protect. That's the type of application or that's the type of instruction you would give at the higher level. And to do that, you would build what we call uh, state machines. Remember state machines long ago in digital logic? These are a little bit higher. And uh, these little bit higher state machines say I'm going to do this type of operation until I'm done, then I'm going to go off and do that one. So uh, I hope to get to those by the end of uh, the class for here. All right? And so that is today's app of the day. Thank you very much. Do some of the homework assignment, which is due on uh, Wednesday. The, uh, the main idea about timers, I'm going to give you the, the, the gist of, of everything else. Uh, in the world of in the world of computers, everything is uh, based on timers. So let's take a look at one example. In the world of CDMA cell phone use, every 1.024 seconds, the phone listens for a page from the base station. So imagine this. There's only a pres precious amount of uh, 
airway frequency available for all cell phones, mobile phones. And as we're sitting in this class, just as a guess, how many people, uh, how many guess all but two of you? How many of you have a cell phone in your pocket right now? All right. Or with you or something like that, all right? Let me, how many of you don't have a mobile phone with you right now? All right, nobody. Good. More than I thought. All right, uh, so let's say, for example, all of you have Verizon or Sprint or Cricket or... Not AT&T, not uh, T-Mobile. CDMA, all right? So let's say all of you have CDMA. I could say with pretty, pretty strong certainty that nobody in here is on a cell phone call right now. Right? Yeah. And if you are, you are really sneaky. <laughs> but nobody is on a, on a mobile call right now. Theoretically, nobody's on a call. But every 1.024 seconds, your phone will wake up, listen out there, and say, do I have a call? Nope. Go back to sleep. And one advantage of that is you use less energy. Remember we had an exercise earlier in the semester where we had something that was running pretty high, pretty high um, current use for a very short amount of time and then it went to sleep for a lot of time, right? That's exactly what your phone is doing. Your phone to use the, to use the uh, uh, transmitter is actually consuming anywhere between 60 and 200 milliamps while you're in a call. And you don't think that's much? That's an awful lot to be gobbling up on your phone, especially if uh, um, you don't need to do that all the time. But when it's sleeping, it is well under one milliamp. And that's how you get this uh, really, really, really long uh, time for, um, for your battery life. So if your typical cell phone battery, I don't know, I think they're coming close to 800 milliamp hours. So if your phone was continually listening at 200 milliamps, your phone would last how long? Four hours, right? How many of you have a uh, battery life of more than four hours with your mobile phone? Yeah, just everybody, right? So when you're in a call, it's consuming up to 200 milliamps. And the rest of the time, it's really low. So it's good to burn 200 milliamps only for a very short amount of time. So you need to have an alarm clock. We use a timer to wake up the phone every 1.024 seconds. Warm up the radio circuitry. Then go out there and listen. And if it finds that there's nothing for it, then it goes back to sleep. If it listens and it says, hey, the base station is telling me that I have an incoming call, then the phone will do all the other powering up it does, like power up the screen, um, start powering up other, other parts of your uh, uh, circuitry. It'll handle all the software associated with setting up the call, and then it will start bringing in the, uh, uh, the call data, like uh, who is calling. The, the number, and uh, then of course, if you answer, then it starts to stream all of the data. Of course, it's all digital. By the way, in the old days of analog phones, your power consumption would be in excess of one amp. And uh, you imagine something that was transmitting one amp right next to your head. <laughs> you, you cooked uh, quite a few hair follicles that way, so. Uh, uh, so if, if you see some of the older guys around with, with you know, bald hair, you know that's what did it, right? So, um, let's get back out of here. Timer. So we have a timer. We want to wake up. Maybe in some cases you want to wake up more frequently, right? You also can set up a timer to do that. So what are two aspects of, of timers that you think you're going to need? What is a timer based on? Real time. Say that again? Just a clock in general, right? 
We'll assume that we, uh, we say crystal, but we'll just call the clock. And what else do you need if you're going to be running a timer? Counter. Some sort of counter, or for that matter, a uh, alarm clock set, right? In other words, wake me up every uh, wake me up every one millisecond, one second, whatever it takes. Now this differs from something else. This differs from something called an event counter. An event counter is going to be something a little bit different. I'll give you a good example. If you have a robotic vehicle that uh, has wheels and you want to count how many rotations that wheel goes so you can figure out how far you've gone, you can add a or you can use a wire directly to the outside world and use some device like a Hall effect sensor. So let's look at two, uh, two situations. We have our, our wheel. And you could put something here that uh, that met on the wheel itself like a magnet and then measure pulses as, as they go through. And if you have something like a wheel, it'll be pretty synchronous or it'll, it'll be pretty much the same frequency. If you have something else like a conveyor line which is counting boxes as it goes by. And you have some sensor, like maybe a light sensor. Your frequency will be a lot more unusual. This is, this is where the conveyor lines stop for a second. All right? Still, what's the important thing you're measuring when you have any sort of event counter? Edge. Edge. You are looking at either the rising edge or the falling edge, whatever you decide, and that will determine how you count and how you count up. So the basic premise is as follows. In a timer, you have a synchronous clock, and based on the synchronous, synchronous clock, you will accumulate in a register one for each time you have an edge. So in this case, From this time right here to this time right here, if we started out as zero, what will be the contents of this register at the end of this? Now let's count them up. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And at the end of this, what will it be? One, two, three, four. However, with an event counter, the whole idea is that you feed this with not a clock. And often with a timer, you preset this with a value so that you don't start at zero, you start at something else and then you count up. And then when you roll over from 255, if this is 8 bit, when you roll over from 255 to 0, then you reload that preset. Now why would you want to do that? Alright? 
in case of an interrupt. That's one idea. Okay, let me uh, let me look at something really quick. All right, let's say uh, let's say we have a 24 megahertz clock. And let's say for our system that we're going to measure something over a great amount of time. So we'll, um, instead of using the 24 megahertz, and this would be the P clock, or the peripheral clock, let's say we'll want to, let's see, we'll divide by 800 and, or 8,192. So now what is our clock frequency? Where's my math uh, people in here? Everybody's so so meek and quiet today. Are you all tired? Two, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, divided by eight, one, nine, two equals, well, that's pretty darn low, 2, 9, 2, 9, 6, 8, 7, 5, all right? So that is my frequency in hertz, and it does hertz. Everybody's so sad because I have such bad jokes. <laughs> Uh, let's see if my memory recall comes up. Oh, you bet it does. All right. Uh, one divided by memory recall, which means that each clock now is equal to 0 0.0003413 seconds. Do you agree with that? Yes? How about the guy sleeping in the back? Does he think that too? Okay. <laughs> just just check it, man. Now you're just resting your eyes, right? Okay, good thing. <laughs> but let's say I want to uh, what is this? Nail, caught, right? Well at least you show up, so I think for that I should give you a have you got a prize already? Yeah. Yeah, you, 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 need, you need another one anyhow, right? <laughs> Let me give you this prize, all right? Oh, I'm on film. I can't do this, can I? Because I, I might have this. You're leaning over here. Here you go. It's a softball. Just as long as you don't throw it back at me. All right, so. He sleeps you. Yeah. Maybe I'm sending the wrong message. Just sleep, you get a prize. Yeah, next lecture you guys are going to come in with sleeping bags, right? <laughs> Let's say I want to set my alarm so it'll go off every 100 milliseconds. How many of these timer ticks is that? Pull out your calculator, figure it out. I'm writing down the solution, so I'm not going to tell you what it is. 
All right, the answer is? Say that again? I said uh, 100 milliseconds. Uh, 292.96. I don't know about you, but uh, I don't really get 0.96875. So I'm going to have a little bit of error there, right? So let me go again, 293 times, or I should say, um, divided by 2929 six, Eight seven five, and that's going to tell me how many seconds I really am, right? Okay. Now two ninety three divided by two nine two nine point six eight seven five. It turns out to be, oh, this is so close, 100, oh my gosh, is that right? 0106. I don't know, if this, uh, if this is measuring um, how frequently I'm going to, or if this is a, a, an alarm that will tell me how frequently I'm going to Measure the temperature in this room. Do you think I'm, that's accurate enough? Yeah. If that's to uh, run the time of day clock, is that accurate enough? As long as you reset it every day. Yeah. As long as I reset it every day. <laughs> that's probably why the clock in my car loses a, uh, a minute every month. <laughs> right? Because some energy, some ener or energy, some uh, engineer said, "Ah, eh, close enough." Right? <laughs> but the main thing I want to know note is that, well, if running at <clears throat> at p clock divided by eight uh, one nine two. Count up 293 ticks. Count out 293 ticks to equal 0 0.100 seconds. So that's pretty good. So what would you do? Well, you would take a register, and by the way, it depends on the, uh, the machine that you use. You could take your, uh, your register here, and you could load it with 300, I'm sorry, 293, and then you could say countdown. And it would count down, you know, 292, count down to 1, then 0, and then when it rolled over, rather than being whatever its maximum number is, FFF, it would reset to 293. And actually, uh, if anything, you would load it with 292, 
because, uh, oh no, you would start at 293 because the first tick would uh, lower it down to 292, which would happen almost immediately. So, pretty good, right? Just look at that number. If this is a register, how big does a register have to be? Okay, nine bits. How many nine bit registers have you seen in our machine? Not too many. Nah, yeah, not too many. Would that, that, so that, I couldn't do this. If I have eight bit registers, I couldn't do this, could I? Uh, have you done the homework already? No. Okay. So the answer is yes, you could put two of them together. So in this case, you would put this into a, like I showed here, 16-bit. So you need 9 bits. Just use two 8-bits registers. And that is the general premise of what we're going to be doing with our timer. Now with our timer, you have <coughs> let me do this ECGR 4101 so with our timers you can set them up to 8 bits and there are 4 available Or you can set them up for 16 bits, and then you only have two available. Well, that works out pretty interesting, doesn't it? So you can cascade two of them together, and the thing that you need to keep in mind is that if you cascade them together, you actually identify one is going to be your counter. And when it overflows from 0 to 255, then back up to 0, that triggers 1 to be added to this, and it makes it an event counter. So we'll look at this, how you use this as an example. Now, in our architecture, for this, note that there are different types. Stop moving. Uh, notice that there are two registers here. These are called time constant register A, time constant register B. And, oh, by the way, you can combine two channels together to make one larger one. <clears throat> Both of these are going to be used for, an example, this is timer unit zero, to extend the functionality of it. And we'll look at that as an example later. As always, you need to set up the different registers. And so if we look at the, uh, the software that has been, uh, or I should say the examples that have been provided to you in the book, I just want to look at that really carefully or, or really quickly. So this is when I also need to pull up the, uh, the manual. This is not going to work out well. Hold on a second. We'll need to pull up the manual.
We are looking specifically in chapter number 20, associated with our 8-bit timer. The 8-bit timer configuration, as we said, we have a unit 0 and a unit 1. You saw a drawing of that earlier. considered the unit one, which has different parts to it. This is unit, I'm sorry, unit zero, which has channel zero and one. And then we have unit two, which has channels two and three. The specific control registers So associated with each one of these is, as you could imagine, we have a time constant register A and B, which I, uh, I pointed to earlier. You have control register TCR. You have time counter control register and timer control status register. Can you turn Continuation of 4101, 5101. By the way, um, yeah, this is pieced together, so bear with me. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, those of you who are watching this on tape uh, are, are one of the uh, people who are picking this up in countries like India or, uh, or Egypt or, um, let's see, another country they've mentioned, Brazil. And uh, everybody else is going to be picking it up from the U.S. because they're watching it for the spring semester. So good luck. Have fun. Woohoo! All right. This is continuation of lecture 18. Specifically, lecture 18, if you could even see it. Holy cow, look at that. All right, there we go. Um, is the, uh, the timer. And so, uh, to help you along, I've handed out these, uh, these pages from chapter 8 because together we're all going to figure this out. Um, I've had uh, plenty of people come to my office today. Uh, asking for stuff, and hence I didn't do the lecture notes. So let me, uh, let me just go on and say, let's figure this all out together. So, one of the things that I was mentioning, if you remember the last class, we talked about timers, we talked about 8-bit versus 16-bit, we talked about uh, things like frequency and, and how often you'll actually see that. So I do want to mention some some parts of this too, and I do have a couple of slides that I wow I want to get to. So let me pull these up really quick. There are two main aspects. We've seen this all along with any sort of uh, application. I'm sorry, with any sort of peripheral associated with our embedded systems. Number one, you set up the you set up the uh, the system. You set up the the registers that are required, and then you use those registers for whatever your, uh, your application is. Oh, come on. I sure hope I saved it upstairs. I did not. <laughs> so I'll just start at the beginning and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this. So here is our, here is our, our block diagram for our our system, and that is a whole bunch of different registers that we use to set. We also have time constants, which if you remember, we could set these to get different 
uh, lengths of time that you will execute. Now, one important aspect of that, this is going to kill me that I didn't do it. Oh, I, I do have it here at least, all right? is depending on your specific clock that you use, in this case, which if you use the peripheral clock or if you divide it by up to 8,192, then you can get up to 22 seconds off of 16 bits of the, uh, of the entire time. So again, the uh, the calculation, if you look at this right here, our peripheral clock, for example, is 24 megahertz. If we choose the P clock divided by 62, then if we uh, compute it out for the entire amount of space allocated for 16 bits, again, you get this number 174.76 milliseconds. So, what I would like to do is, in this class, say, what setting can you make that will get you to the closest for one millisecond exactly? So, the, uh, the operation or the, uh, uh, the work I want you to do, I want one millisecond. What will be your P clock? And what will be your and what will be your value in a 16-bit register? If you remember from the last class, oh man, this is number four. If you remember from the last class, we did a calculation for 100 milliseconds, but notice that it, you didn't have a, a, a solid number. In other words, you didn't have anything that would, uh, would be exactly one millisecond or 100 milliseconds. It was something else. So let's see, what can you do that would get you exactly that without any uh, decimal point after this? This will be your quiz number. 13 or so? So, by the way, you could work with one other person. So choose wisely. And again, one other person. Put both of your names on a piece of paper. One person. Uh, somebody in the back and somebody in the front. Mr. Caldwell, you want to work with somebody in the back? Right. Anybody in the back want to come up to the front? Much in the back. Let's go back. So the question was. That's the entire clock. That's the processor clock, not the peripheral clock. So, which one of you two is, uh, or which one of you five is, is pairing up over there? All right. Say that again. This one? No, the one that you, what you want, the one that I want. This one. Yeah. This one. Say that again. Reason the system 
that. Okay. Again, I assume the peripheral clock for our board is 24 megahertz, which I think it is, right? Yeah. That's um. That's how many ticks you get, or. That's the time. How many ticks you get in one minute? All right. Let's just do a let's divide it by. A, This was period? given. 8192 is given. It was given? In the question. Okay. It's always 24 megapixels. That's our purple clock on the board. So if we have this as 8192, we have a frequency uh, that. Anybody done yet? No. So this is for 16 Thank you. 
that one up to the house. Mm -hmm. That's that, and then you take one millisecond and put that over this number. So one to uh, point zero zero. No, 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 no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I got that. So, this is how many. No, no, no. These are ticks now. Because seconds happen. So, this is how many ticks we get per one millisecond. So, our register will be our P clock. Our P clock 8192. Our P clock 11. We will have in our. 16-bit register, a, uh, this value, 2.99. So this is what the register will count up to before it overflows. So if we use a different number, you want to use a less a lesser number. Somehow I got a relationship between the period. Well, obviously not. All right, who's not who's uh, who's not done yet? Oh wow! What was that? Who's lost? <laughs> so who's who's got a solution yet? Let me see if. Uh, I think it's right. You have the same answer, different P clock. So does it matter? The answer is no, it doesn't matter. But you've chosen the minimum. The the does the value in the 16 bit register is the number of ticks? Yeah, the value in the 16 bit register is the number of ticks. Per one millisecond. Per whatever clock is. And it's the same if you change it, change the division of the peripheral clock from like 8 to 3. All right, here's a good question. What if, what if you do the following? Right? If your P clock is. Something over, let's see, what are my, what are my values? 128, right? So my cl P clock is, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, uh, 2. Let's just do a P clock 2, right? And I have 2 clocks. How many of these pulses would I get? Well, yeah, I'm not going to do it. Is this part of the test? Because we already turned it on. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so if this is P clock divided by 2, right? I got it. What would P clock divided by 8 look like? More tick. It would look like just one. Because one is such a big Alright, P clock divided by 8 would look like. Two by, um, like that, right? Would everybody agree? So the difference between P clock divided by 2 P clock divided by 8 is you get fewer clock ticks. So that leads you to believe that if you choose P clock divided by 8 versus P clock divided by 32, 
you would expect to get a lot fewer in uh, p clock divided by 32, right? Which means that if you choose p clock 2 and you have some number n, and you choose p clock 8, how many n do you need to be the same if you're adding up inside of the uh, register value? 4n? Yeah. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's the hint. That's how you can get multiple values, right? So is everybody done? No. Oh man, I gotta move on. I'll give you one minute.
So obviously, MN is going to be equal to 0 0.01, I'm sorry, 0 0.01 seconds times 24 megahertz. By the way, megahertz uh, means cycles per second, right? So we get the, the value of 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, right? So m times n is going to be equal to 24k. So obviously, what was n again? n was clock divisions. M was counts. So obviously, if N is equal to 1, 2, 8, 32, 64, that's as far as I'm going to go, M is going to be equal to 24,000, right? 12,000. 3,000, 750, 375, and can you actually go any less? Can you go any less? No, because otherwise this is an odd number, you're going to divide an odd number. So here's the question. Uh, I see these guys back here. We got it! Woo! Uh, now that I've gone through this, it's kind of obvious, isn't it? All right, so um, as often as in embedded systems, things are easier than you really make them out to be. So make sure to uh, think about that in the future. All right, so let's look at the nitty gritties now. Implementation. Setting up a timer. Rather than go over this in great detail, it's in the book, all of the, uh, all the little registers that you have to set and why. It's also in the, uh, the manual. Just want you to keep in mind that, yes, you need to enable the overflow interrupt to be able to uh, identify that something needs to go on. By the way, when you set up an interrupt, these two instructions right here are associated with the concept of interrupts, which I'm actually going to start on in the next lecture. Remember in our design, or in the design of the uh, device, the timer device itself, you have the... Uh, the units themselves, and this is timer unit number zero, channel zero and one, so you're going to activate each one of them. There are the different registers, for example, the um, MR1 versus the uh, MR0. Again, you're identifying MR0 versus MR1. In other words, you're setting them both up so you could use them. Then you're going to load them a little bit later for uh, different bits or different aspects that you want. This is, uh, again, another aspect of what you do with uh, the overflow. And in this case, you want to interrupt. Also notice this too. Remember, we've said in the past that we're putting two 8-bit registers together. And a nice picture of that is also in the book where you say, oh yeah, here is timer MR0 versus timer MR1. These are actually separate registers. They have separate addresses, but you can tie them together by 
setting one of the bits to say the count source for TM R1 is going to be, uh, or the count source for TR, TM R0 is going to be TM R1. So in other words, the smaller byte is feeding the larger byte. And then the count source for TMR1 is going to be the P clock 1. So that sets up the situation where that feeds that and P clock 64 is what feeds the counter. And then we said if you're just going to run flat out, again the example, we're going to count up from 0 to uh, 65535, five, which is the maximum count. And as soon as that entire 16 bits is filled up, then you will generate this interrupt. So if we were to set this up for our situation, If we set our P clock divided by 64 and we looked at our notes, that means that we would have to feed 375 into our registers for counting up. This is where I start to get all discombobulated because I need to see where to set it up. So what is that? Uh, what is that value? Where does it go? The preset for this? So if we want to count up from 0 to a certain number, where do you put that value? It's a constant. It's a constant value, but where do you put it? T power A. T con A. You put it in the constant register, right? Yeah. And then it'll use that as a preset and it'll add up. All right? Now, the second part of this is a concept called pulse width modulation, which is another part of the homework assignment that I want to cover really briefly. There's a good explanation of this in the book, but I just want to show the concept. Pulse width modulation is often used for motor control. Did you use PCM for this? Yes. Okay. Using the Arduino? Yeah, that was all pretty fun already did. So. All right. This is a quick demonstration of what it is. So let's say we wanted to have a two millisecond period. That is from the beginning of one edge to the beginning of the next edge. So that is going to be our period. What's the frequency of this signal? So period is equal to 1 over the frequency, right? Does that look better? Well, maybe this. No wonder this thing couldn't focus. All right. So if our frequency is 1 over period, right? is equal to 1 over 0 0.000002 seconds. So our frequency is 2 milliseconds. Uh, isn't this thing say Oh, it says milliseconds. Sorry. So, and the answer is 500 hertz. 
That's painful. <laughs> uh, nobody wants an A in this class, do they? Nobody laughed? Except for, for you, so. You know what? You laughed at my joke. There you go. the book. I was asleep. No. But I'll give you a I'll, I'll give you a piece of candy. How about that? Oh. Let's see. Uh, it's, it, uh, it, 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 it melted. Is that okay? <laughs> it's a little less okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> now, to be able to get this, there's two things. Oh, and then also the duty cycle is. How long do you want the output to be logical one? And you only get a choice of logical one or logical zero. You don't get anything in between. So to do that, you need to set the time that this will go, and then you need to set the time that this will go. And that's how you control your pulse width modulation. So you have two different registers that you need to set. And those two different registers will determine what your frequency is and, again, the frequency from here to here. And then also how much time you spend inside. So if you look at the specific code for this, again, we're going to set this up as an example. And uh, as extra credit, credit, extra credit for your exercise is... What is the frequency and duty cycle of this? So here we go. We have a P clock divided by 8. We have a duty cycle of 20. We have a frequency of 55. What page you This is page 327. In other words, remember that one page I had earlier? Do I need to do this because it's a little bit confusing? All right. So again, if we're loading P Cora A is equal to 55 hex, which is equal to what in decimal? 85. And T Cora or T Cora B is equal to hex 20 which I know is equal to 32, correct? So, if I looked at earlier, we said M times N is equal to 24,000, right? What is N? This will be N or is that M? N is 8. All right. This is M. This is another one of the M. And N is equal to 8. 
So now we know that M is equal to, say that again. Speak up, I can't hear. 3,000. So, 85 divided by 3,000 is equal to, my calculator people, 28 milliseconds. Right, 28 milliseconds. By the way, 32 divided by 3,000 is equal to? 10 So what you have is, over the time, we have a rising edge of the clock at time zero for Ten point six milliseconds. We have it high, and then it's low for the remaining time, which is what? It's twenty-eight point three. So it's high for ten point six, and it's low for twenty-eight point three minus. 10.6, 17.7, by the way, which is uh, what kind of a percentage? So what is 10.6 divided by 28.3? 37. 37.37 what? My dyslexia is getting there. So you have a 37.4 duty cycle. So in other words, it is high. Remember our, our definition of, uh, of duty cycle is how long is it high? It's only high for, in our case here, 37.4% of the time. Then it's low for the rest of the time. And if it's running for 28.6% milliseconds, what is our frequency? 35? 35.3 hertz. Oh man, look at this. And it's the end of class time. So that is it for lecture 18. Thank you very much.